Come and go up on today's episode of the Salesman Podcast. So the only place that matters is value. And the thing that helps drive value is credibility. The credibility you establish is someone who can genuinely help them get done what they need to get done and bring tremendous value in solving problems. They buy from those people. And at the core of that is trust. Because if you don't trust somebody, they can't be credible. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm Will Barron, host of the Sales One Podcast, the world's most listened to B2B sales show. If you haven't already, make sure to click subscribe. And with that, let's meet today's guest. Hey, what's up, peeps? My name's Keenan. I am the author of Gap Selling and CEO and founder of A Sales Guy. You can find me at a salesguy.com and or on Amazon. On this episode of the show with the legend that is Keenan, we're diving into gap selling, how we can uncover what the gap is, the insights behind that, how we communicate it, and how it makes closing essentially obsolete, how it makes winning new business once you get all this down at the front of the sales process a whole lot easier. Let's jump right in. What myths are currently being banded around the, the sales training space, the sales industry as a whole, whether it's from trainers, whether it's from leadership, whoever it is, what myths are being banded around that perhaps were true 10, 20 years ago, but aren't necessarily true right now? One is that you need to be liked. That's the big one, that you need to be liked um, to sell. Another one is that, you know, good closers are good salespeople. That's a crazy, ridiculous myth. Um, another one is that price matters and that people buy on price. That is not true. Right. So those are, those are your three big ones that really, you know, that, that, <clears throat> I mean, another one is that your elevator pitch matters. You know, the idea that you need an elevator pitch and, and that matters. Those are, those are some of the bigger ones that people throw about and still try to teach. So why is it? Cause the, all these are seemingly counterintuitive, right? And I know objective management group have data on the fact that salespeople who don't feel, and I might kind of screw this up from their terminology, but salespeople don't feel like they need to be liked by their customers outperform salespeople who want to be liked by their customers, for example. So there's, there's clear data on this, but it's still seemingly counterintuitive of, we think that people will, and this is perpetrated of people buy from those that they know, like, and trust. How much of that equation is perhaps then trust as opposed to actually liking the individual? Oh, it's it's all trust, right? I mean, at the end of the day, people don't even people don't even buy for trust, right? I do. I have a four quadrant matrix that spells the whole thing out. Like is on one axis, and and uh, <clears throat> value is on another axis, right? And the only axis where people buy every time is on value. So if they like you in this value, then they're gonna buy. Right. I mean, I like you and this value and what I'm buying. So I'm going to buy. Um, but if you go to the I like you, but there's no value, they don't buy. They just because I'm not buying you unless you're the product, which is different. Right. Then there's a whole bunch of other things. But if I'm not buying you, I'm buying a software, I'm buying services, I'm buying a babysitter. I don't freaking know. <clears throat> right. And so I'm not buying. And then the other <clears throat> excuse me, the other column, which I don't like you and there's no value. Well, you can only imagine that's <laughs> just fuck off. Right. I mean, that's just fucking go to hell. And then the other place that they do buy is this value, but they don't like you. There's value, but they don't like you. They will buy. So they'll. So the only place that matters is value. And the thing that helps drive value is credibility. Right. The credibility that you can that you can garner or that you can establish is the best word. The credibility you establish is someone who can genuinely help them get done what they need to get done and bring tremendous value in solving problems. They buy from those people. And at the core of that is trust. Because if you don't trust somebody, they can't be credible. How does then, how does then the, the, the being a closer come into this? Is it as, is it as simple as, Five, 10 years ago, you could push someone down the the, the pathway of, of the sales process and get them to sign on the dotted line, whereas now buyers perhaps have more power. And so that somewhat of ability to either push or manipulate someone is less useful because people just don't care as much. So, so <clears throat> great question. So they really don't go hand in hand. The problem with closing, if you remember closing, the assumptive close, right? Well, okay, this is fantastic. So if I get you the, you know, I'll get you the the contract tomorrow. You're just you're assuming the close and that they'll just go along with it, right? Or if you say, hey, if I if if I can get you this and this, then you'll close, right? <clears throat> All of that is what is what I call product centric selling. 
And all of that is based on the premise that you have told them about the product, you told them what they need, you may even listen to them a little bit, but you really have no idea on why they should buy. So you have you don't know if they're ready to close or not, right? Or if they should close or not. And what I argue is that the close is actually at the beginning of the sale. Your ability to actually uncover the intrinsic motivations of why they need to buy, the impact of why they need to buy, their current state or current situation and, and what's happening, why they're in trouble, what problems they're struggling with, all of that. When you get all of that and then you offer a solution, you know if they should buy, you've already addressed all of the things that go into it. So at the end, it's a simple I don't even know. It can't even really call it a close, right? It's all right. Let's move forward. Like it, it's done. There is no close. There is no, you know, I got to get them to some point. It's it's already done. It's all done in the beginning, not the end. So if you're going to be a hard closer, you you didn't do the upfront work. Um, so what's the difference then, Keenan, between that and then traditional kind of textbook just qualifying? So textbook qualifying in most cases, people are looking for a need. Right. So they're saying, go find a need or go find the pain. Well, there's two problems with those. If you're trying to first, a lot of time people confuse the two, which is a whole different set of stories. But if you're looking for need, it assumes the customer knows what they want. Right. And that's a huge mistake, huge mistake. And I talk about tell a story in the book how I thought I needed a charger one time. And, I, and, and what I ended up needing was actually a case. Right. And I had no idea that I needed a, a case for my Palm Pilot when I thought I needed a charger. Right. <clears throat> and it's a great story in the book. And had that salesperson not asked some questions and tried to get to my core problem, I never would have got it solved because I went in to buy the wrong thing. Well, that happens with customers all the time. So salespeople are trying to sell them stuff um, based on what they think the customer needs because they're looking for a need. The second one is they go in for the quote unquote the pain. And first, we don't even do it very well. But when they do find the pain, that doesn't necessarily mean, again, it's the right problem. It could be simply a symptom, right? <clears throat> so it makes it very difficult to influence a sale if you're trying to shoot for a need or a pain that isn't actually at the root cause and or isn't what the customer actually needs. So it doesn't allow you to do a good job. Uh, the discovery that Gap Selling talks about is about breaking it down into, into current state plus future state. And that equals the gap, the difference between the two. Then you have a total understanding of what's going on, where they are today, where they want to go tomorrow, what the space in the middle is. And then when it comes time to offer a solution, it can be customized because your, 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 um, your discovery actually created a custom environment, a unique environment that is only specific to that buyer. So how then do we know? And I don't know... I, I... It's even a weird question to ask because it seems like so simple, but it, perhaps it's profound of how we uncover it because this sets up the rest of the sale and the conversation. How do we know the difference between we've uncovered a symptom of the problem versus we know the actual problem itself? How do we separate the two it, like, live in a conversation? Yeah, so it, it happens as you dig deeper. So in gap selling, the way we talk about the discovery is <clears throat> first got to go after the current state. That's first and foremost, right? So the current state consists of the physical and literal today. Like, you know, like, I don't know, depends on what you're selling. You got to be aware of what you're selling. But if you're selling, I don't know, lead services or uh, plumbing services, I don't get plumbing services, right? Then you got to understand, okay, how, what type of house do they have? Uh, how many bathrooms do they have? You know, how many showers? Is it copper piping or um, uh, plastic tubing, right? Whatever. And you ask all these questions and it's non-judgmental. It just helps you understand the lay of the land. Then after that, you have to understand what are the problems that they're struggling with, right? So do they get clogged often? Um, does the water run slowly? Do you not have hot water? Like, I'm just, you know, guessing stuff, right? So now you got to understand the, <clears throat> the problems they're having. Then you go to the impact of those problems, right? Um, impact is, is two people can't take showers at the same time. Um, I'm constantly having to buy freaking Drano. Um, our hot water bill is through the roof. I don't like, what is the impact? Then the next one is, what is the root cause? And now as you start to dig into the root cause of the problems, what you start to build is a very, very custom assessment that is only specific to that customer. And when you add all four of those things up, you start to get it, the actual problem starts to come together. As opposed to like, oh, okay, I thought that was a problem. Now I realize that's just a symptom because as you dig and you dig and you and you get all four of those layers, the problem becomes automatic. 
And how do we, is there a process of getting the person that we're speaking to to visualize this and take it in other than uh, like walking them through it, if that makes sense? Are we asking people to go, well, and it sounds cliche as I say it out loud, but it sounds ridiculous as I say it out loud. You know, imagine this problem 10 years into the future. You know, tell me the pain that you'd be in, almost like a kind of psychoanalyst or a psychiatrist would do of us. Are we trying to, are we trying to get to. into the brains like that? No, you don't have to. It's amazing. Like a lot, like, well, so when you asked about traditional discovery, right? One of the things traditional discovery people do is they go, can you tell me what you need? Right? They literally, they just, they, they just ask this one question. Can you tell me what you need? Or can you tell me about some of the pain you're experiencing? Or, you know, they just ask these stupid, direct, direct, direct questions. In gap selling, <clears throat> what we do is we encourage people to ask very broad, open-ended questions. It's literally like, Tell me a little bit about your current. I mean, we're running on this stupid analogy. You might as well continue with it, right? <laughs> tell me a little. Tell me a little bit about your 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 current plumbing and your current um, bathroom and kitchen environment, right? And then they'll just start talking, and and as they talk, you listen very intently, right? And you should know what questions to ask. So as they say, well, we have, you know, I don't know, we have one bathroom, right? And then the, and and the next question may be, oh, really? How many people live in the house? Like you should automatically click one bathroom. Is it one person or 10 people? If it's 10 people, that's an interesting problem. If it's one person, not a problem. Continue. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then they say, um, we have a shower and a, and a tub separate. Okay, interesting. And you just you just let them go and you keep teasing little more out of them to start understanding the environment. Then when you understand the environment, then you should you should naturally be able to understand some of the problems that come with that, right? And so you start asking questions to tease out problems there. So let's say it's a it's a, a woman and she's 32 and you said, do you have long hair or short hair? Now, why am I asking that question right now, Will? Why would I ask do you have long hair or short hair? Uh, blocking up the drains. Yes, yes, yes. So this is a very complex way of thinking. You have to be very, very in tune with what they're saying and what the problems could be and what the root causes could be so that as they're talking and she says long hair, you can say, Oh, so do you find that your hair clogs the, the drain often? Well, how many times do you get clogged? You get once a year. Is it usually hair related? Yes, it is. Okay, now I know that if I have any products that can address that, I'm going to bring them up, right? That's how you do it. You, be, you just pay very close attention to the environment and what they're saying to start to look and tease out problems that they're not processing. How do, well, the first question is, are you, are you having some plumbing work done at the moment? Why is this top of mind? No, I have no idea what this is <laughs> Because it's always hard, like there's different businesses out there. Yeah. So um, the, reason, the reason I ask, I'm having a kitchen fitted uh, in a couple of weeks. So I'm, I'm, I've got all this kind of stuff top of mind. So it's just a weird coincidence. Yes, yeah, so like if you, I was working with you on your kitchen, I would ask all kinds of questions. Like, is it you, are you and your wife? Is it you and your kids? Who, how often do you like to cook? What does she like to cook? Um, how do you cook today? How often do you cook today? What type of meals does she cook today? Because I might be thinking you need is something as silly as you might. I might even recommend the 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 boiling pot thing that comes out of the um, yep. behind the stove. You know that thing we, that we, comes out. We've been through that conversation. We're not getting one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't need you bullshit yeah. like that in the kitchen. Uh, right, yeah. go, 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 going off track here, Keenan. Let's pull it back on. So how do we, because it seems like if I was to call, if if Richard Branson was to call me up and say, I, I've got a few questions about your business, I might be able to help, I would answer any questions he could possibly imagine and he might be able to give me even just nothing to do with uh, consulting with him or working with him in the future. He might be able to give me one or two pieces of information that could blow up my, my business or change the way I sell or, or anything like that. But if Joe Bloggs emails me saying, hey, hey, Will, we've got this new SaaS. I've just changed accountancy firms and accountancy software. So perhaps Joe Bloggs rings me up, calls me, says, I've got this awesome new SaaS software. Let me get on the phone with you and I'll solve all your problems. I'm going to say, probably not got time to get on the phone with you. I've just, I've just switched kind of 10 minutes ago. How do we frame this up, Keenan, so that we are setting ourselves up as a, an expert to be consulted with as opposed to a, a pesky salesperson who's trying to steal yes, time. Yes, yes. So notice how you just, you even yourself, who's been doing this whole sale things for years, just led with a product-centric email. You said, hey, I'm Joe Blow with accounting software, with accounting software. I'd like to talk to you about how I can solve all your problems. You started with, I'm with accounting software, right? What you needed to do, <clears throat> you can say I'm, I'm with 
so and so, but you needed to start with a problem or a number of problems that I think you might have. So why did you switch your accounting software? Because there was zero accounting and bookkeeping done beforehand, and now the revenue is getting to the point where it needs to be it needs to be done. Basically, yeah, but you said there was, zero, but you had one. You had one before, right? Uh, you essentially spreadsheets. Okay, okay. So you're using spreadsheets. That was your current state. Yep. So if I know that many of my prospective clients are using spreadsheets or um, starter accounting packages. I should know what types of problems that causes. So name one type of problem that you were having because you were on that spreadsheet. I We registered for VAT and it was a mess to go back and see what VAT, this is a kind of tax in the UK. Yeah, that I yeah value on tax. Just, just for the audience um, who aren't in the UK. And yeah, I need to claim a ton of it back. Now that we're registered, we have to pay it so that you can have it offset your bill. And it's literally going, me, me, it means me going through 12 spreadsheets per year for the past four years to kind of put all that data together. Okay. So I might, if, if I'm good and I know that my target is people like you, small businesses that could be on old or in what kind of stuff, I would have led that email with, Will, if you're having trouble or getting frustrated with having to spend countless hours trying to attach VAT through spreadsheets or this accounting software, that accounting software, I'd love to talk about how we can address that in many of the other time intensive um, accounting issues that small businesses have because they don't have the right accounting software. Would that have gotten your attention? It, that would have got a phone call for sure. Yes. So notice I'm leading with the problem. And this is what most people don't understand. When you're selling a product or service, that product or service was designed to solve problems, whether we talk about them or not. So you should know what those problems are and talk about those problems first. That's problem-centric selling. Don't talk about your product and what it can do. Start with the problems that have to exist before your product has any value. What That's is the, I love it. What is the cadence of that, Keenan? And what I mean by that is, is this a, Email with one problem, then we follow up on that problem, then we pitch a second problem further down the line. Uh, the answer is it depends, I'm sure, but is there a structure to kind of to build a, a system around this? It, it, it does. It depends, right? It depends on how, how big are the problems that you can solve. So if you only solve one really big problem, I would probably stick to it. Yeah. If you sell several, if you solve <clears throat> several key problems that just different businesses could have. One business could have this and it's a big one. Another one could have this and it's a big one. <clears throat> then I might round robin it, but I go at least two to three touches on the same problem before I, before I pivot. And would you then perhaps, cause we talk about social selling and it seems to die down a little bit now. The kind of like hype around that, but are we then sending people content in the next email? Are we, or are we always trying to just get that initial phone call? Is that always the call to action? 85%. Now, if I'm going to add content, I'm going to add content that's going to um, support or explain that problem. So let's say, I mean, I'm, again, I'm on the fly on this, but if we're using your accounting software and I get you on that, I hopefully I've got some information that talks about the average, you know, half million dollar a year company um, spends 25 hours on that and they have these many mistakes and these mistakes can cause you these problems. So I might educate you on the problem if you don't feel that it's a problem because you didn't may pay a right VAT and you're paying fines in in right in retro or whatever. Um, <clears throat> so I might do that. I might find content that um, uh, reinforces or or that yeah just reinforces the problem or explains the problem. So I'll go that route. Mm -hmm. And then because I I, I, I want to rush through this because I feel we can paint a, a good picture around the subject. The answer is by the book if you want to go more depth into it. But say that we get on say that we get on the phone call. It all go and you know, nine times out of 10, it's probably not going to go as, as swimmingly and seemingly as what we're describing here, but we get the, we uncover it, that whatever the issue is, they have that aha moment that we're all searching for. Everyone's happy. Everyone's excited. How do we follow up and reinforce the fact that we've un und undiscovered, we have discovered this issue. We potentially have a, a solution. How does this get formalized? And because I guess if we can get someone to agree to what we've said, then we're, we're halfway there to, to closing the sale, right? So this is, yes, we're, we're more, well, okay, so yes, but the key is this, getting them to accept and only have a problem is only half of it, right? Then you need to um, 
outline the impact. Remember I talked about those five things, physical and literal, problem, impact, right? <clears throat> Root cause, and then I didn't talk about one emotion, how do they feel about it? When you have all those on the table, the impact is the is the motivate. That's where intrinsic motivation lives. So the impact is I'm paying fines, right? The impact is how much are you paying in fines? X, Y, Z, right? The the and how if you weren't paying those fines, what would you be doing with that money? Um, what is your mark? I'm making this up. What is your marketing budget? Would, would you have moved that money from those fines to the marketing budget? Has it cost? What does it cost you to pay those fines, right? Or whatever the impact is. So I'm gonna lay the whole impact out. Once you get them sitting in the impact. It's a simple transition to, to the future state now, right? And it's okay. So where are you trying to go? Is your company growing? That's a currency. Yes, it is growing by 20%. So if, if this keeps growing at 20% year over year, these fines are going to continue to increase. And so is the amount of hours you're spending. So you're going to lose more and more money. So therefore, you want to get to a future state where you're not losing this money and you're saving this X amount. And then you start asking questions about, um, well, what do you want? Where do you want to take the business? What other initiatives do you want to embrace? And so now it's, I don't know, make, I want to start a podcast, right? <laughs> and it's okay. So now all this 12 hours is going to make it harder to do the podcast. Yes, it is. So now I've got them all focused on this whole future state where I can stop paying the fines. Um, I'm not spending 12, 15 hours a month doing this. I'm not, uh, I can, I can do other things that I like, I've never thought about. I can, um, which I can forecast my business better. I can get a loan, like all this stuff I can do that I can't do now. I spend this whole future state and, and then all of a sudden it becomes just a natural transition. I'm here, now I wanna be here, the gap is this, that's what we start selling on is the gap and it, that's where the closing is already starting to be done. Um, I think it's James Murr who came up with this. Maybe maybe I'm kind of paraphrasing him slash 15 other people I've talked about on the show, but I always know without all this structure, in hindsight, I can put some of this in place, that I've done a great sales call. It's been, I've added value to a conversation when at the end of it, I can just go, does it make sense to work with us? And the answer is either, the, the answer is either yes or no, because, and then you can you can backtrack or there's an objection or there's something you haven't covered. Is that the goal that we should have with all of this, that we just get to the yes. end of the conversation and go, does, does it make sense to move forward? Yes, yes, it's that simple. It's that simple. <laughs> it is that simple. Now, getting all that information is hard. I've watched, sure. I've got to tell a quick little story. Um, I was called, and I talk about it in my book, I was called by this company. Um, they'd already called several sales experts, influencers, right? Some have been on your show. Some have written books. Like, they're the names we all know. And he had seen me speak at a, at a uh, conference, and I don't know why he decided to call me. He, he Just something wasn't clicking with the other ones, right? Yep. And these are, you know, these are sales experts. These people know how to sell, right? <laughs> And he got me on the phone and he, and we talked for a while and I went through the, the whole gap selling approach, current state, future state, you know, obviously you don't tell them that, but you're just going through the whole thing. <clears throat> and one of the things I dug out is um, uh, he, he told all the reasons he wanted. He was very capable by He's like, I want this. I need this. This is the problem I'm having, da, 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 da. And so he said all of the other sales leaders jumped right on those things. He told them, explained what, how they could help and walk through how, what they do it and all this stuff. And then I went to a place I, and asked some questions. I said, you said you're growing. I, I said, um, uh, so it's not like you're losing money. He goes, no. And I asked him some questions about how he was structured. And he said, you know, and he explained how he's structured. And I was like, well, that's kind of a little messed up. And I said, um, I said why is this growth so important to you? He said, well, it's not that growth important. I just don't want to fall behind. And I said, okay, that's interesting. And then I said to him, I said, um, I said uh, um, wh what is your goal? What is your growth goal? And he said, well, we want to get to uh, 48 in 2020. And this was in 2000, end of 2017. And I said, oh, okay, where are you now? And he gave his number. And I did some quick math while I'm talking to him. I said, wait, you're behind. He goes, yeah, we're behind. I go, you're behind $7 million. It's your current growth rate. You're not going to make it. And he stopped and he goes, yeah, you're right. And I said, so this isn't just about growing. You've got to make up some, 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 um, make up some lost revenue here. So you can't just keep growing. You need to grow faster than you're even faster going now to make up what you lost. He said, that's a great point. And then I said this, I said, why, why 48 and 20? Well, it was a big BHAG we had. And I said, that's it. It's just a big BHAG. I mean, okay, that's fine. So if you don't make it, it's not the end of the world. He goes, no, but one of our competitors just got bought and when we get to 48 to 50 million, the valuations change dramatically. 
And I said, what's dramatic? And he said, like, it, it could be an extra two to two to four X from where we are now in valuation. Plus we're 50 million. So it, it's yeah. really worth a hundred million to us. I said, oh, I said, who owns the company? It was just a handful of us. I go, oh, so all of a sudden I now know what the intrinsic motivation is here. And so, and I was like, okay, this is what's going to happen. This is what you need to do. This is the only way you're going to get to this. And I got the gig. And I tell you the story in that I beat out a number of very well-known sales experts who didn't do this. None of them uncovered where he was going, trying to go. None of them uncovered 48 and 20. None of them uncovered that there was a potential exit. None of them uncovered where he was and what was preventing him to get there and the fact that he was 7 million behind. That changed everything. So that's what it's about right there. So a good part of this, seemingly, um, as, as I listen to you and as I, and I process this myself, Keenan, is that you just got to really give a shit about the person that you're speaking to and they can't just be another another number, another dial, another email that you're spamming with some kind of automated software. So with that to one side, because I think everyone can appreciate that, everyone can wrap their heads around that. How do we make the leap from say we're new to sales and we're a junior salesperson and we want to share these insights. We want to dig into these conversations and we want to go deep with it all. How do we make the leap from you know, what you're describing here of, you know, I randomly threw out accounting software. Clearly you've got your, your finger on the pulse of, of, of VAT and different things that you subtly mentioned. So you've got your, you have a good head for business. You're an entrepreneur yourself. How does someone compete with that? If they are either new to sales or they're new to a specific industry how do they learn and get all this background knowledge that allows them to ask these really useful and, and powerful questions? So one of the things you do in, in the term that I like to say is how do you go from product centric selling to problem centric selling, right? And the way you do that is you start by doing your homework and research on the problems. So I, I'm, I'm waiting for a company that hires me that lets me build a problem centric selling uh, training for them. Because if you, you get a new job and you go into this accounting firm and they're going to teach you everything about the product, everything is going to be product centric. They're going to teach you all the different features and functions and how it works and who their customers are. They're going to teach you um, how to build an elevator pitch. They're going to teach you how to build messages that talk about the product. I want someone to flip that script, right? And what I do is I create something called a pick list, right? And it stands, it's a, it stands for problem identification chart. And it's made up of three columns. The first column is, is the problems that your product or service solves. What are the pro problems that you know that your product or service solves for your ideal customer profile? Then the next column is the impact to an organization if those problems exist. Then the next column is what is why do those problems exist or what are the root causes of those problems, right? If you fill that out and you are accurate and in depth, in, in, in depth <coughs> excuse me, and you're in depth, you now have your guide. That's your map. You look at the problem. You look at the impact it can have on an organization. You look at why it, it um, uh, why those problems exist. And then you can start having those conversations with anybody. You can enter the account any way you want through that. You can go to the impact first. You go to the problem first. You go to the root cause first or why they happen. You can do any of that. Do we need to do anything else to set ourselves up when we send that email? And what I mean by that is, um, clearly, uh, the example you just give, Keenan, someone saw you on stage speaking. So immediately, you're an authority in their eyes, and they ring you up, and you've you've uh, pre-framed yourself as an authority by that kind of link. For the, not the average B2B sales professional, but the, the high performer or the aspiring high performing B2B sales professional, is do we, if we, if we send an email that highlights the problem or hi, our hypothesis of the problem that an individual has, is that good enough to get a phone call or do we need to do all of this stuff? You know, if you, if you follow this, it's it's stuff. If you're against this, it's bullshit around building a social media profile and social selling and creating content and being at the the, the, the front of your industry on multiple levels. If we are good at diagnosing a problem, sending a customized message to the right people, do we need all that other stuff? Or is that is that necessary in, in the kind of marketplace we're in? So it depends on how you want to define success, right? If you just want to be the salesperson that's, I don't know, that's trying to make President's Club and trying to make hit their quota every once in a while, or, or I guess every day, and just work within the confines of your industry and work within the confines of your company, don't do it, right? And if people are responding to your emails, 
and marketing is providing you inbound leads and, and people are calling you and your pipeline is big enough, then don't do it. But if you actually want to put gasoline on the fire, if you actually want to be, you know, the top in your space, if you actually just don't want to be some average dolt, then yeah, you need to do it. Because the cool part is you get out there and you create videos or you write blog posts or you write LinkedIn posts or you um, spend time on, on Instagram and you highlight the problems and you create content on solving the problems. You create content on how those problems impact an organization. You create contact on how they impact and bring down organizations. You're like, you just keep creating content and educating people on the problems you solve. By default, you'll create your own personal inbound engine, right? And you'll have that credibility. So I don't know why people don't. I just think they're foolish. But yeah, that's that's what I, absolutely that's what I would do. Absolutely what I would Good. do. Good. I, I knew you'd say that. I tried to tee it up that way. And and let me give a bit of context from this and I'll, I'll see if I'll ask you if this is somewhat common, I guess, when you're kind of working with individuals or, you know, you're at least pushing them in, in this direction of of being the top of, the, of, of their industry in their spaces. I get asked for to consult on things, to come into businesses, to do all that kind of stuff somewhat regularly now and i always refuse oh, if i don't refuse i just put a ridiculous price on it so that everyone kind of uh says no sod off you you lanky bugger what you what you kind of playing at here um because i don't want to do it i've not got time to do it kind of got other priorities right but four years ago if you'd have said to me right you're gonna do this podcast you're gonna ask you know questions that hopefully sales people want to hear and on the other end of it you're going to be you know people are going to be well, both speaking gigs and people are going to be throwing consulting jobs at you I would never have believed it. So what I'm getting at here, Keenan, is, is it worth doing all this, doing the extra mile, because it doesn't just separate you and allows you to become, uh, have your own inbound engine for your sales role. It potentially sets you up for just bigger things in your career moving forward as well, doesn't it? Absolutely. What people don't understand, and I talked about it in my first book, Not Taught, is that exposure and awareness and reach are the most valuable assets you can have. Right. I mean, reach is like gold. It's like oil. Right. There's a look at the the it's it's a brilliant example, whether we like it or not. But the Jenner twins. Right. Those girls were on a show where they almost never spoke. OK, no, I haven't seen the Kardashians in a long, long time. So maybe they moved them into a more prominent role. But in the beginning, back when I start, watched the show with my my, my daughters and my ex-wife, because that's what they wanted to do it, it, in before what's her name no, not, what, uh, before Bruce Jenner became I forget who he became uh, what's her name Don't you, I, I know the names but I've never watched it yeah. <laughs> um, Carrie or whatever <laughs> before he became before he changed over those twins were, had played no role but everybody knew who they were right so they had they had reach they had exposure they had millions and millions and millions of people who knew where they who they were so once they got older all they had to do was flip that switch, just flip it, doot, and then start engaging with those people, talking to those people, doing stuff, sharing their lives. And now um, Kylie, I think, is almost worth a billion dollars. I think she is. I think she's one of, if not the youngest female billionaire. Okay, so she got over the hump. I think How so, How did yeah. she do that? Yes, she leveraged that reach and started pushing cosmetics. Now, it's not to say if she pushed cosmetics that, that were bad, she'd be able to do it, but the point is, she had the reach because she had, it started with exposure. She didn't have to do anything. She didn't have to do an act. She didn't have to, she just, just people knew who she was. That's why I'm emphasizing this. I'm leaving her sisters out because her sisters showed personality. They were on the show. They had speaking roles. Like they could build that, right? All the twins did, they were just in the background for the first four, five, six, seven years. There's nobody's, but because they were there and millions of people saw them, they were building reach. And at, once they decided to flip the switch, it was gone. So why the average American does not spend time building micro reach, whether it's only 1,000 people, 500 people, 10,000, is beyond me, <laughs> beyond me. And then what they do when they need something, they go out onto LinkedIn and say, hey, I've just been let go. I'm looking for a gig. Where the fuck have you been the last five years? You wouldn't have to do this if you had actually built reach. Are, you, right? are like, you familiar, Keenan, with um, the the concept of a thousand true fans? No. So uh, I'm pretty sure his name's Kevin uh, Kelly. He's the founder and maybe still, maybe not, kind of chief editor of Wired magazine. He's got a really good article. I'll link it in the show notes to this episode. And basically, this works for 
an entrepreneur. It works for perhaps you're a sales professional in a specific industry and you want to turn that into a consulting gig or you want to do speaking, whatever it is. Or the, one of the examples he uses in this uh, blog post article is a band. All you need is you know, a thousand people, a thousand people who love everything that you do, who will spend a little bit of money with you each year. Say for the band, they buy the, the $100 EP, the, the 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 record, as opposed to just the digital download. Um, as a consultant, maybe it's not a thousand people, maybe it's a hundred people, and they all give you, you know, a thousand thousand dollars for you know a day's work or whatever it is, whatever people are charging as as consultants in their specific niches. Once you suss out that it's so few people and you can reach them so easily, it it changes uh, paradigms on this. It changed my mindset on all of this. Of um, for the the podcast, and it's slightly different now with that we're doing. But I knew that if I had ten companies that would give me ten grand a year to sponsor the show, so I only had ten customers to sell to, that was a business or the the beginnings of the the kind of seeds of a of a business there. So I read this article, I translated it into that, and that's how I went about everything. And I find that the bigger, not necessarily the bigger, the better your relationship, not because we kind of poo pooed relationships at the top of the show. The more value that you can give these individuals, whether they yes, like you or yes, not, yes, I'm learning. Yes. I'm, it is going in, yes. Keenan. <laughs> the more value you give to these people, yeah. the more they'll pay. You. Yes, and and the yes. more value you give them in the meantime, the easier they're going to pay you and work with you in the future. That's what I was getting at with that. And we're not talking about Kylie Jenner with how many million or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of followers she's got on Instagram. We're talking about you, perhaps me, as a medical device salesperson in Leeds. I just need to give value to 32 urologists and I will smash my target, do multiple six figures every year. And it's as simple as that, right? Yes. Yep. Yep. You Good got man. it. That's it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Good. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad I kind of tied it all together there. Well, with that, Keenan, I've asked you this question about 47 times now. I'm going to ask you again just to wrap up the show. And that is, if you go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at selling? Nothing. <laughs> you got to give me Nothing. something to work with here. That, what? That, that's what I say every single time. Let me, let me, let me go back. Let me, what would you right now tell if you could, if you could put it in a, a letter in a time machine and send it forward, what would you tell your kind of 60 year old self? Ooh, I like that one. Um, remember, remember what got you here. Right. <clears throat> and that is, <coughs> excuse me. That is, there are no rules. Um, family and friends matter. Um, and that life is too sh well, too short. And by the way, this is messed up. That's only 10 years from now. Okay. So uh, my six-year-old self, you got to come up with a, a, an older year because that's it's nine years from now, actually. So that that's not a good one. <laughs> but it, it, that, puts, that puts it in perspective because as you yeah. said it, it seemed in my head mm -hmm. like a long way down the road, but it's really only nine years from now for me. So, and so I won't forget, but that's, I think that's why, or, or why I am happy with the life I've lived and where I've gotten is I just have a very youthful, a very um, high energy life that just, that just doesn't make me feel that I'm getting old or it's moving down the road. You know, I, I literally forget that I'll be 51 in April. Forget it. Like I'll be reading articles and they're like that 52 year old man died or the six year old man. I'm like, God, that, I, I hope I'm healthy when I get there. I'm like, Oh snap. I'm there. Like, <laughs> like, like, Oh my God. Like I'm almost there. Yeah. So it, it's, it's, it's an interesting perspective that I have myself in. I do not feel that six, 60 is a million years from now in my head, but it's really only nine. Good. Well, I could dive into that for another 15 minutes and kind of get your insights <laughs> for us, us young guns who are following in your footsteps, Keenan. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up with that. Tell us where we can find Gap Selling. Find us, tell us where we can find more about you as well, because you put out so much awesome uh, video content. It's well worth kind of following and, and seeing what you're up to. Thank you, sir. So uh, look, I do a lot of video on LinkedIn. So talking about giving, right? I just do LinkedIn content, tell people how to handle uh, different sales scenarios. It provides tons of value in making you a better salesperson. Um, you can find me on Amazon where you can find Gap Selling on Amazon. It last, I didn't check in the last few days, but it's it's been the number one hot new seller on Amazon for almost two and a half months now, which has blown, blown me away. Um, and you can also find me at a salesguide.com, just a salesguide.com. 
Good stuff. Well, I'll link to all that in the show notes of this episode over at salesman.org. And with that, Keenan, I want to thank you for your time, as always, mate. Uh, next time you're on, we'll dive into phase two of the, the kitchen fitting at my place and the saga that's going on there. And with that, mate, I'll uh, speak to you again soon on the Salesman Podcast. Awesome, baby. Love coming on here. You, you do. Appreciate it.